So the anode bevel, right? Um, we talked about the focal spot. The focal spot is given um, by the anode bevel angle. The anode bevel angle controls the uh, actual size of the focal spot. Um, but it is just that, right? There's, a, there's a, a, a disc of tungsten, and it could be cut as a square, okay? You could imagine it cut as just a 90 degree square, okay, or a rectangular shape, right? But they didn't, they cut this at an angle, okay? We call that the bevel, the anode bevel, the angle at which the anode is cut at, okay? Um, and you know, because you did the quiz, you know from the quiz, the average anode bevel angle is 15 to 17 degrees. Okay. It can be shallower um, in the cases of um, angiographic radiography. This is like blood vessel imaging. Specialized x-ray machines can have shallower anode bevel angles, giving you better spatial resolution. Remember, the size of the anode bevel affects spatial resolution. So with a shallower angle, we can have better spatial resolution, better detail. This is all due to this concept called the line focus principle, okay? It might sound complicated. It's really not, I promise you. Um, so let's take a look. So let's just see what the line focus principle says, the definition. It says the size of the projected or effective focal spot is crucial to the sharpness of any image. The size of the projected or effective focal spot is always going to be smaller than the actual focal spots. That's what the line focus principle tells us, right? The, the, effective actual fo the effective focal spot is always smaller than the actual focal spot. We'll talk more about that on another slide here in just a second. Two things affect the size of the um, actual focal spot, okay? The width of the electron beam from the filament, okay? So this, this electron beam, let's erase a couple things. just have like this you don't just have one possible filament that can emit um, that can emit x-rays right so there's one filament or they can emit electrons rather there's one filament you have a secondary filament that is only half that size okay you have two filaments to choose from we say that our x-ray machines are dual focus you have one of two filaments and these uh, these filaments these coils of wire one is short and the other is tall, okay? Um, roughly speaking, the short one is about half the length of the tall one, okay? Now, the short um, filament will produce an electron stream that is narrower, skinnier, okay? The big filament will produce an electron stream that is wider. So either a focal spot, you know, that big or a focal spot it's the size of that whole thing, okay? Either one um, is, is available to you, okay? You can change the size of the focal spot where the x-rays originate from by changing from small to large filament, changing the width of the electron stream, okay? We know that the width of the electron stream changes the size of the focal spot. I just said that. And we know that the size of that focal spot affects detail, spatial resolution, okay? Question. Yes. Is it important the number of electrons that are in that stream? Not so much. I mean, Not it's important for like mass calculations. Well, we could figure that out if we can really get Definitely, it. right? Okay, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I, you could do it pretty, pretty straightforwardly. Uh, by knowing how many electrons are in one amp, right? You could figure out how many electrons are in one milliamp. And then you could easily figure out how many electrons are in 100 milliamps, right? Because you set things like 50, 100, 200, 300 milliamps. Yeah, not, not, not important. Not important. Yeah. What is important is the, the size of that stream, okay? Either the small stream or the large stream from the small or the large focal spot giving you, a small or large filament giving you a small or large focal spot, okay? The smaller that focal spot, 
the better, the, the greater the detail. The larger that focal spot, the poorer the detail. Okay? And so that's one thing. The width of that electron stream matters. Okay? The second thing that matters, and I just won't even bother drawing it, is the angle of the anode face. Okay? So with an, uh, if an anode face is at 17 degrees, this one here, the shallow anode angle, there's a width to the beam of electrons. Okay? And in fact, the width here of the beam of electrons is the same for both of these, okay? However, because this focal or this anode bevel is, instead of 17 degrees, angled back at 45 degrees now, this electron stream is going to spread over a wider area. So this focal spot, the actual focal spot, is larger here than it is here even though both of these beams of electrons came from, let's say, the small filament or the large filament, it doesn't matter, but each one came from the same filament, okay? The beam of electrons is one width. The angle of the anode bevel changed the size of the actual focal spot, okay? So, the actual focal spot affects sharpness. The angle of the anode bevel will affect the size of the actual focal spot. So. If this were um, less than 17 degrees, would the actual focal spot be larger or smaller than this one? Smaller. Smaller, yeah. So the shallower the anode bevel angle, the smaller the actual focal spot, okay? You would have the um, smallest actual focal spot if your anode was just a square, a rectangle. You know, if it was just rectangular shape, then you'd have the smallest possible actual focal spot, okay? So now's a great time to ask a question. Does everyone know, understand what act, the actual focal spot is? Joshua, what's the actual focal spot? The actual focal spot is like what you're targeting, like they say, like it's a hand, the hand is the focal spot. Oh. No, the focal spot is the, on the anode. Oh, on the anode. This is inside of the x-ray tube. Isn't that what focuses on the object? No. Focus, focus focal spot has nothing to do with focusing the object. Yeah, the, the hit, no? It is where the electrons are hitting the anode. Okay, the focal spot is where the electrons strike the anode face. Spinning anode face, electrons bombard that anode face. That anode face is cut at an angle, making a size to the area where the electrons hit. Okay, all X-rays will be emitted from that spot. Okay? The angle of the anode affects the size of that spot. Okay? The size of that spot affects our detail. So with a larger area, we have less detail. Again, remember the analogy of the lights in this room producing a shadow? Okay? Or a single flashlight producing a shadow? The detail change, right? A single flashlight can produce a clear shadow, where all the lights in this room produce a very blurry shadow. Okay? The size of the area that the light comes from changes our detail. Yeah. At what angle from 17 to 45 does it change to the opposite way? Um, at 45 degrees. So you're good, it's smaller, 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 until you hit 45 and then it starts getting bigger. Then. So no, um, uh, so zero degrees, right? Smallest possible. Anything more than zero, you're getting bigger. Your actual focal spot is getting larger, 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 larger. And at 45 degrees, your actual focal spot will be the same size as the affected, which I haven't talked about yet. Um, so any angle from, uh, from zero, any angle bigger than zero, makes your actual focal spot larger. You can, you, you can extrapolate this, right? You can imagine we're at 45 degrees now, right? Mm -hmm. You can imagine going to like 70, 80, or 90 degrees, and then your actual focal spot will be spread out over a huge area, right? Um, so the greater your anode angle, the larger the actual focal spot, the larger that this space is here that's being struck by this beam of electrons, okay? And it's just, it's just geometry, right? This beam of electrons comes this direction, you're hitting a, a disc, a face, right? And that face can be at, in principle, any angle, okay? The larger that angle, the wider, the bigger that actual focal spot is, okay? Okay, so now, 
Um, there's the actual focal spot. So you imagine you're, you're the anode, you're standing there, and you're watching the beam of electrons come towards you. The, the area that's hit by that beam of electrons is called the actual focal spot. Okay? Now imagine that instead of being the anode, sitting here watching the electrons come at you, you lay underneath here and look up. Okay? When you lay underneath and look up, you see something different. Okay? If you look up under this one, you see one width, one apparent width to you. And when you look up under this one, you see a different apparent width of the focal spot, okay? It's exactly like this, right? Um, I just need something. <coughs> if I hold this, right, over here, Enrique gets a view, this whole face, like, so you can see this, right? This has a size, yeah? This, you can measure this size, it's 12 inches tall, 10 inches wide. This would represent a spot that's emitting light, because light's coming off of this, that's how you can see it, yeah? If I put this facing straight at you, you see the whole thing, right? But if I put this at an angle, okay, Enrique gets a great view of it, right? He gets to see basically this whole thing, okay? Lewis, do you get to see it as big as it was, the face of this, as big as it was when I was holding it like that? No, because he's at an angle to it, right? Michael gets a view of it that is narrower than Enrique's view. Abby gets a view that's even narrower. And Lewis is really past that point where he doesn't even get to look at the face of it anymore, right? So just holding this at an angle, the face of this at an angle, you can see that your position relative to it changes your view on it, right? You know, um, Emmanuel has one view. That he sees it roughly, you know, some amount of width. Um, Abby sees it at an, as a narrower width. Right? The apparent size of it, the size that it appears to you, is different depending on your position underneath it. Right? Emmanuel's roughly, uh, you know, if we, if we take this table to be the, the thing that we're measuring from, Emmanuel's roughly at a 90 degree angle to the table, okay? Um, where Abby's not, right? Abby's at, Abby, Abby's at a greater angle to the table than, than, than Emmanuel. Enrique's the exact opposite direction, okay? This would represent the apparent, there's, it has an actual size, but when I put it at an angle, the apparent size, the apparent width of this that you can see changes, okay? And it's just that, it's just changing the apparent width because of that angle, okay? So you, now you imagine, instead of, it face, instead of that cardboard cassette facing you, right? You imagine laying underneath her and looking up at the anode face, okay? And it's like that in the x-ray tubes, so you imagine looking up at it, right? it would have an apparent width to you, okay? The width that you would see would be bigger if you had a 45 degree angle and smaller if you had a shallower angle, 17 degrees, okay? So while both of these use the same width for the stream of electrons, meaning they use the same filament, both of these, small or large, doesn't matter, the angle of the anode face changed the size of the actual focal spot and changed the width of what we call the effective focal spot. The effective focal spot is what you would see if you looked up from the table at the x-ray tube. Okay? And it wasn't blocked by a bunch of you know, mirrors and glass and metal. Okay? But it's the apparent size of the focal spot, the apparent size of the area that the x-rays are, are originating from. The effective focal spot is what matters for spatial resolution. It's what matters for sharpness, okay? Focal spot is not focusing the x-rays. X-rays cannot focus, okay? It's not like visible light. There is no possible way for x-rays to be focused. They don't bend, okay? They don't refract and bend like visible light. All we can say is that there's a size of the space that they came from. The space that they, all the x-rays originated from is called the focal spot, and it has an apparent size. If you lay underneath it, it has an apparent size to you, okay? Now this is standing directly underneath it. You're at basically, you know, you're basically 90 degrees to it as you look up to it, okay? However, the line focus principle says, depending on where you would stand, now we're imagining standing and actually looking up at this, right? But imagine now being the, the, the radiograph, you're the, you're the, you know, the image receptor, right? This is the anode here. This is representing the anode up top. So over here would be the cathode, positive anode, negative cathode, okay? As you move yourself further towards the cathode end of the image receptor, 
the apparent size of the focal spot gets larger. Okay? And it's just, it's just, you just imagine that you stand here and look up at the anode. It looks bigger to you. Okay? Now, if you stand over here and look up at the anode, it looks smaller to you. It's just your view on it. It is nothing more or nothing less than this. The, the apparent size of this face is different depending on where you're standing in the room and the angle that I hold it at. Okay? If I put it straight at you, it looks one size. If I hold it at an angle, it looks a different size. Okay? And depending on where you're sitting, it's got a different size. You don't all have the same view on this, right? Everyone sees the apparent size of this, this width to be different depending on where you're sitting. That's this, okay? Translate into, it translated into image properties. The anode side, so if, if this is our table here and our anode's over here like we've shown, this side of the image receptor has an apparently smaller focal spot. Smaller focal spots will improve image detail, okay? We get better sharpness with smaller focal spots. So what's the difference between the line focus principle and the anode heel effect? So this is dealing with sharpness, and the anode heel effect is dealing with a beam intensity, yeah, uh, which we're going to get to. They, they both are, um, they're different things coming from a similar area, okay, yeah. So you said the smaller the focal spot, the greater the sharpness. Definitely. Absolutely. That is a very good takeaway from this. Um, okay. So yeah. Now, so we have a focal spot. That's the actual focal spot. Then we have the apparent or effective focal spot. And it's different in size depending on where you are, where the body... Now, tr replace you with a body part, right? Take like um, any bone. Like a long, let's get a long bone out. Here's a basket of bones. So here's our long bone here, okay? <laughs> this end of the long bone, so that, imagine the image receptor underneath here, right? This end of the long bone, because it's towards the cathode side, the apparent focal spot is larger over here. This end of the long bone, this distal tibia, is closer to the anode end, which has a smaller apparent focal spot. The actual image produced will be sharper here and blurrier here, okay? Not by a lot, but it is there, okay? So, and it, it, you can't get rid of it. It's just due to the angle of the anode has an angle, and depending on your position relative to the anode, the size of the apparent focal spot will be different, okay? Smaller apparent focal spots improve detail. Larger apparent focal spots decrease detail. This is all to do with um, geometric integrity. This is recognizability when we think about our imaging factors of visibility and recognizability. This is all about recognizability. So you actually get a better image on the uh, anode end than the cathode end. It's clearer, sharper. Yeah? So the anode end was not something that changes? We control? No, or, or definitely not. Like it is fixed, yeah. So that's a nice thing, right? The anode angle is fixed, but it is sharper on one end than the other, right? Good. Um, yeah, so from the anode end of the image receptor, the focal spot appears smaller. From the cathode end of the image receptor, the focal spot appears larger. That's the line focus principle, okay? Let's um, move on. There's an additional concept called the anode heel effect, okay? So just uh, try, to, try to just drill this in. The line focus principle that we just talked about simply and only deals with spatial resolution detail, okay? The anode heel effect simply and only deals with beam intensity, okay? They're just different concepts coming from a similar area. So the anode heel effect, the, book, the textbook definition is, a variation in the x-ray intensity along the long axis of the tube, along the length of the tube, or along the length of the table, let's say. The beam gets weaker rapidly towards the anode end of the table and stronger towards the cathode end of the table. We're measuring that relative to the central ray. So relative to that center point, it's weaker towards cathode, stronger towards, an towards anode. Sorry, weaker towards, <laughs> stronger towards cathode, weaker towards anode. I got it. 
<laughs> All right, so <laughs> Wait, <laughs> my coffee is still full. The anode right, what's, right what's written here. The intensity falls off rapidly towards the anode. So weaker towards the anode, stronger towards the cathode. And again, this is measured relative to the central ray. So this, uh, this flash radiograph was made. Um, this was made with the cassette um, not, not flat to the table. This was made with the cassette like this. Okay. So they put the cassette like that underneath the x-ray tube, and then they shot down on it like that. Okay. And what they notice, what you notice is there's less exposure on this end, the anode side, and there's more exposure. It's, it's denser, blacker, more radiographically dense on the cathode side. Okay. Why? I'm about to show you. It's, it's the why is it, it, the anode heal effect is why, but here, here's the actual why. So the anode, this thing, the anode, um, it's, a, it's a disc of tungsten, okay? And all the x-rays originate from the face of that disc, okay? Now, they travel equally in all directions, right? So some x-rays go up from that, that's a terrible color. Some x-rays go up from that point. That's also bad. Anyways, up from that point, okay? Some x-rays go that way. Some x-rays go that way. They all get absorbed by the anode, okay? They just, they just get caught, absorbed by the tungsten anode because it's really dense, okay? Some x-rays go that way, and they get absorbed, okay? Some x-rays go that way, and they get partially absorbed, but then they make it out. So they're weaker now, but they make it out, okay? Now, the x-rays going that way, they don't have to travel through much at all, okay? They don't get attenuated by much matter at all, okay? So starting from here, it's easier for the x-rays to go all of the directions that are toward the negative side, towards the cathode side, and it's harder for the x-rays to go be emitted towards the anode side, okay? So by the time you get you know, by the time you get like an organized beam coming out of here, right, this organized beam coming out, a bunch of the beam traveling towards the positive side had to make it through all, all of that anode face first, okay? So the beam coming out here is going to be weaker than the beam being emitted through all of that empty open space, okay? So that's the anode heal effect. It's just saying that, uh, the, by the way, the anode heal, is this the the back this back corner okay that's the anode's heel okay and it, the effect of it being there is that the beam gets absorbed more towards this as it travels towards this end okay so once you get an organized beam spreading out traveling towards the patient the primary beam the primary beam is going to have a difference in in strength a difference in intensity towards one end relative to the other end yeah. If we don't control the, um, you know, the angle, are we just moving the patient back and forth like that to adjust the focus? No, um, you're just accepting it. You're just accepting that it is that it is going to be different. Yeah, and we just try to center patients. You know, we have a central point, a central ray, and we sort of try to center patients to that point because we know that things change on the extreme ends of of the of the beam. So we would never we would never put the central ray here, right? and then put the cassette and patient way over here, right? Because we know that the beam changes in sharpness from one end, or the, uh, one end towards the other. So we'd always put the patient right in the center. Now for the an this anode heal effect, um, we are gonna use this to our advantage or disadvantage, okay? So we're gonna have to either use it to our advantage or our disadvantage, so we'll figure it out. So yeah. The anode heal effect is caused by X-ray absorption within the anode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I couldn't have put it better myself. All right, so um, here's an example, okay? So here, here's how you should use this, okay? Any body part that has a variable thickness, right? Like the foot is an example. The foot's sort of a wedge shape. It's thinner at the toes, thicker at the heel. Um, in this case, the humerus, right? We're thicker at the shoulder and thinner at the elbow, okay? And so now we know that one end, the cathode end, this end, let's say, let's say this end of the table is the cathode end and this end of the table is the anode side. We know the beam's gonna be stronger over here and we know the beam's gonna be weaker over here, okay? So we can use that to our advantage. We're gonna put the thick end of the body over here and the thin end over here, okay? So if it's a humerus, I'm putting the patient on the table, 
where the shoulder is towards the cathode side and the elbow is towards the anode side. I'm going to use that difference in beam intensity to my advantage. So this uh, is attempting to show us um, on the image on the left uh, an unbalanced exposure, right? So you'll notice that at the top of this left, let's zoom in a little bit. In this case, on the image on the left, they went ahead and I'm going to kill the lights for a second. They went ahead and uh, made the exposure with the patient's shoulder towards the positive side, the weaker side, so the thick end of the body part on the weakest part of the beam. And they put the thin end, the elbow, down where the strongest part of the beam is. So thin part with the strong beam, thick part with the weak part of the beam. And it gives an unbalanced radiograph, right? We have the top, the proximal humerus, very underexposed, very mottled, right? That's modeling that grainy appearance, underexposed, too bright. And the cathode end, the distal humerus, way too over dense, way too radiographically dense. It's basically blacked out. You can't see much detail down, down at the bottom of the humerus. But if you look at the one on the right, they've now put the humerus, uh, proximal humerus on the cathode side, the strong side, and the distal humerus on the weak side. So thick part, Lights are going back on. Thick part, <laughs> fair warning. Thick part towards the strong end of the beam, thin part towards the weak end of the beam. Okay? Um, so we want to know, you know, we want to be able to use this. This is practical use. This will help you in everyday use. Put the thick end of the body part towards the negative side of the x-ray tube. The, the, the side of the x-ray tube labeled negative. Okay. Now x-ray tubes will never be labeled cathode anode. Okay. They'll be labeled negative positive. Okay. We know that the cathode is negative, anode is positive. The thing that helps me remember that is A plus C minus. Okay. Anode positive, cathode negative. A plus C minus. Um, and you know, it also helps me remember the path that the that the electrons take because I would always rather move from C minus towards A plus, right? Never the opposite direction. You don't want to go from an A plus to a C minus. It helps, I promise you. I learned that 11 years ago and I still, I still remember it. All right, um, anyways, it's, this might change, but as a typicality, you can expect the anode to be on your left when you come into the room, okay? This is typically because, if you imagine this, this being the room here, this is an x-ray table, Anode would be to my left, cathode would be to my right. Typically, and this is not in every extra room, but typically in this case, the wall bucky, which there's usually a wall bucky, will be to your left. Okay, this will change in different x ray rooms, but this is why the anode's on one end and the other. The wall bucky's typically to the left, so when you take the x ray tube, cathode here, anode here, and you turn it to point it at the wall, the cathode would be on the bottom, anode on the top. Okay. And now imagine someone standing here. We're denser down here and thinner up here, okay? So we're using the anode heel effect to our advantage when we're pointing the x-ray tube at the wall and when we're using the x-ray, uh, do, doing things tabletop, okay? Yeah. So our, our, bucky, our wall bucky is on the right side. Yeah, so your x-ray tube will either be backwards, as in uh, cathode will be over here, anode will be over here, bucky's over here, right? Or your Bucky's just over here and your x-ray tube is still the, the, is the, is the wrong direction and you can't yeah. use the anode heel effect correctly. Exactly. Yeah, that happens. Yeah. You have limitations to rooms and sometimes, you know, you have a, an x-ray tube that anode's on the left, cathode on the right, but your Bucky nevertheless is over here. Okay? Right. And that, in that way, you can't use the anode heel effect. So or, I don't know, you have to hang the patient upside just, down from um, the ceiling. You just, um, you compensate with, the, with just your technique. Yeah, you just you just use the best technical right. factors you can. And it doesn't come out well, and we don't know why. And accept and that that's part of the deal. The engineers, but yeah, so we're sometimes we are just limited in our space. You know, you, maybe you couldn't put the 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 Bucky on the left side. So yeah, you just to upside down, duct tape them to the Bucky, and they're good, right? Everyone's happy. No one, no complaints. <laughs> Anyways. <coughs> Here's the, the, the can't fail piece of advice, the piece of advice that is just gonna be good. Put the thick end of the body part pointed towards the negative end of the tube, okay? Whatever the negative side of the tube is, point the thick end of the body part that way. If the body part is uniformly thick, like, I don't know, a forearm or something like that, right? Doesn't really matter, okay? The anode heel effect is only really matters when body parts are sufficiently changing in thickness from one end to the other, or the body part is very long, 
okay? The effect gets uh, uh, accentuated when body parts are very long or when body parts change in thickness um, along their long axis. So this uh, graph, you can find this graph in the text, but let me just use it real quick. A um, couple things here. I want to help you understand them. That's, yeah. that's the whole goal, right? Yeah. So this is a graph. Let me show the whole thing real quick, and then I'll zoom in on it. This is a graph showing you beam intensity as a percentage along the long axis of the table. Okay, so this x-axis here is showing the length of the table, like this way. Okay? The vertical axis is just distance. That's not really important right now. Okay, so this vertical axis is not super important. Um, what is going to be important is going to really happen up here and down here. So let me zoom in to the top real quick. The percentages are the same even if you change the distance. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's why this is not, not so important for this. Okay. So, okay. So let's take a look at this. Let's make sure we can interpret this graph. Um, this is showing you a cathode. This is showing you an anode. What would this spot be called? The heel focus. The focus. The focal spot, right? The anode's heel would focus. be like somewhere back here. Okay. So this is the, the focal spot. This is where all of the X-rays are coming from. <laughs> Just give it a try. That the worst you can be is wrong, right? Okay. So, <laughs> so here's a point, right? The focal spot. Okay. All the X-rays come from there. All of these lines are representing the X-ray beam. Okay, that's one thing. So x-rays originate here from the anode and they spread out through space, okay? These solid lines moving at an angle represent the x-ray beam. Now, do you notice these dashed lines here? Here, 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 right? This is representing the width of a cassette, okay? So this would be, the, the whole thing is like a table. These lines are representing a cassette. Let's use um, that line and that one. So this would, this out, these outermost lines, represent the width of a full-size cassette, okay? So let's follow that all the way down to the tabletop. 43 centimeters wide. So that line and that line. Everything from there to there would represent what fits inside of, a, of the largest cassette we have, okay? Now, right in the middle, right in the middle here, okay, we have the beam listed as 100% of intensity. Okay, that's the central ray. We just say the central ray is as strong as it can be. It's 100%. Everything's measured against the central ray. If you move towards the cathode end, you move towards the cathode end, if you get past, past this dashed line, you are now off of the cassette. Okay, so it doesn't matter what, hap what happens out here off of the cassette. But as you move towards the cathode end, towards the edge of where the cassette is, let's just extend that line down to here. You'll notice that your beam is stronger toward the cathode end, okay? Your beam strength is listed at 103 degrees, okay? Oh, it's 103 degrees. 103%, okay? Which is bigger than 100%, yeah? yeah? So the beam is stronger towards the cathode end, even stronger than the central ray, okay? Now, this is the furthest we can go towards the anode end, okay? So anything beyond that point, beyond this point here, is now off of the cassette. We don't care about it anymore, okay? We care about what's within these brackets. Moving towards the anode end makes our beam intensity, our beam um, power, beam intensity weaker, okay? Down to like 95%. So there is a variation in beam intensity along the length of a cassette, okay? Along this way, long axis, okay? But notice, it's not a lot, okay? If your cassettes were super duper big, yeah, then the effect would be very large. Look at the extreme end of the table, okay? Furthest you can get away from the table, right? The furthest you can go this direction, right? The beam goes down to 31% of its intensity compared to the central ray, okay? at these far extremes. This is the edge of your cassette, so you're not getting any images of anything beyond that point, okay? But imagine instead, normally you center the cassette to the, to the beam, right? Put the, turn the collimator light on, look at that little crosshair, the central ray, put the cassette in the middle, right? But what if instead you took your cassette and shifted it so it was over here, okay? 
now you would be using the weakest part of the beam, okay? And that beam would be traveling at an angle relative to the image receptor, okay? So you change beam intensity and you change spatial resolution, spatial resolution. But we don't do that, right? We center the cassette to the central ray and along that cassette, which is only you know 14 or 17 inches wide, 17 in this case, the width here, the beam intensity doesn't vary that much. So from the middle, it only goes up a few percent towards cathode, and it only goes down a few percent towards the anode end. Okay. But the point is, is it does change intensity along the length of the table. Okay. This is the anode heel effect. This graph perfectly represents the anode heel effect. It's just a matter of like interpreting the graph. And now look at if you went to a smaller cassette, okay? So I don't know exactly what size this one is, so I didn't remember it from the top, but if you look at this one, the smallest possible cassette, you will have much less variation in beam intensity when using the small cassette. So small cassettes are used for small body parts, right? It's harder to see the anode heel effect on a small cassette. The larger your cassette is, the longer your cassette is, the bigger the variations in, in beam intensity are, so we see this on long body parts, long large body parts, not on small body parts, okay? Um, the anode heel effect is always there, but becomes more apparent when there's a large body part on a long cassette. And then we columnate the, the weaker side of the, of the beam. We columnate both directions, right? We columnate both directions to the beam, right. um, sort so, of equally narrowing down. So that limits some of that scattering you don't even the weaker sides weaker and stronger yeah, yeah the weaker and the stronger. you're collimating from from both sides right, right right your cassette might be this big right, right. but you're collimating down from that cassette you're collimating you know you're smaller than the cassette <coughs> your collimated field is never going to be larger than your cassette right collimated field always has to be a little smaller <laughs> okay. Let's finish this up a little bit. Um, I've talked about the rest of this, so let me go on now and. Uh,